Welcome back. It is time for Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. Thanks for being with us, and also thanks to our good friends at BetUS. Make sure you check out BetUS. You can get 150% bonus on your first deposit. All you got to use is the words YouTube 150. That's right, YouTube 150. You heard it here. You get 150% on that first deposit, up to $2,000. And then on your second and third deposit, they're still going to give you 125% up to $2,000. So, Go check that out from our friends at BetUS. Scott Branson, along with my partner, Mo Moten. We're here to talk about Raiders football. Oi, it was a tough one on Sunday. We're going to get into it a little bit. Of course, we we got a lot of therapy out of the way after the game on the postgame show with me and Murph. But now we bring in Mo. Of course, Mo is my partner here. He's the senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report, also the Raiders columnist at SportsNot.com. You can follow him on X at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully, the show. S and B today. Mo. Whew. Well, the fallout of the Panthers debacle. Uh, what an embarrassment for this team, this franchise, for the fans, especially the fans came out in droves to Allegiant Stadium to really cheer on their team, encouraged by a fourth quarter comeback by the Raiders the week before in Baltimore to upend the Ravens. Then they come home, and to say they laid an egg would be understating it. This is probably got to be up there. I know the Raiders over the last 25 years have had a couple really big doozies, but this one, especially with what's been going on with this team over the last six, eight months, uh, was a surprise in so many ways. We're going to get into that a little bit, but I want to get your initial thoughts about not only the loss. You lose games, you win games, that happens. We knew the Raiders aren't going to be a 12-win team. At least you and I believe that. So you knew it was going to be up and down. We talked about this before, one step forward, two steps back. So just get ready for the ups and downs. But Sunday against the Panthers, one of the worst teams in the NFL mode, they were completely dominated in every facet of the game, including at the line of scrimmage. Give me your reaction. Tell me what surprised you the most. <sighs> Scott, had to there's the most sigh. There's the sigh. I mean, most sigh wearing a tie. Oh, okay. Now we're, <laughs> now we're getting into Dr. Seuss territory. Now we, we definitely are. I had a bleach report live, as you all know, after the game. And there were about 100 people in that live. And usually I have, you know, a script where I go through the box score, I go through some highlights, get some fan comments. I started out with a 10 minute monologue where I was just like, look, the, first of all, the honeymoon, the AP, the Antonio Pierce honeymoon is over. There's no way. You have a game, a finish to a game like you had last week against the Ravens where you come back and have that big victory. You have all of that momentum. And then you have your home opener against a winless football team at the time. Backup journeyman corner, quarter, quarterback in Andy Dalton. Yes, I know he's played well against the Raiders in the past. Seven touchdowns, zero interceptions coming into that game. But is a backup journeyman quarterback. With a number two running back, because their star, run, not star, but their starting running back, Jonathan Brooks, is on the uh, NFI list because he's recovering for 20 CL. So you have a backup quarterback, you have the number two running back, you have a head coach for the Panthers who's less experienced than Antonio Pierce, right? <laughs> uh, you, the Panthers don't have their best offensive lineman in Derrick Brown, Pro Bowler, out for the season with a knee injury. Their secondary is a mess, and the Raiders were dom not you said dominated, they were out coached. They were outplayed in every phase of the game. And it's just inexcusable to have that type of performance in front of your home fans in the in the home opener. Your mm -hmm. first home game of the season coming off of a big win against the Ravens. And this is the performance you put together. This is what you have. And Antonio Pierce, after the game, what and we're going to probably talk about this, but after yes. the game, what burned my biscuits when he said this, that Certain individuals made business decisions. Mm -hmm. So after a week one loss against the Chargers, there was a wake up call. And now, guys, and now whoever is making business decisions, we're three weeks into the season, and you're telling me, guys, the people in your staff and your building are not all bought in. It's September, Scott. You usually hear comments like that in December for a team that's preparing for the offseason. Right. And remember the 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 uproar and <clears throat> I wouldn't call them mutiny. 
But the push by Raiders players, including Max Crosby, and I'm not criticizing Max Crosby here because Max Crosby, even though he was pretty much neutralized on Sunday, guy plays hard. He, he, he does what he does. But remember, this is a guy who said he might want to be traded if Antonio Pierce isn't the coach. So you can't get me to say, well, where's the buy-in? Uh, well, he's, he's this guy, he's that guy. No, from what I heard consistently from most fans and people we talked to was, oh, he deserves this job. He's got the locker room. These guys believe in him. They believe If they believe it, and this is where I know some people are going to get pissed, Mo. If you believe in that coach so much that you wanted to get traded if he didn't get the job and you all went to bat and posted in social media and then you go out there and perform like that in your home opener, boy, man, I, some, I mean, I don't know what it is, but there's multiple things, Mo, that are not right here. And I know it's only three weeks into the season and I know you and I had preached patience with this team and with the coach because he's a new head coach, right? Yes, he had some games last year, but overall full-time head coach is his first, his first go-round. But what concerns me with this is we know we know some of the issues with the offense. We'll get into that. But the other stuff, the fact that he calls out guys in a press conference like that, a little out of school, uh, if you're a veteran coach, they might do that behind closed doors a little more instead of airing it out, you know, the dirty laundry out in front of the media, which is not something we've seen from Raiders coaches at all in a long time. So he does that. And then, again, Antonio Pierce multiple times in this game as a head coach made – Huge errors, right? Including uh, when you look at being down by 20 points and punting the ball, right? I mean, there was there was no aggressiveness. Remember all the ill intent, violence, pain. Like, where is that? Scott, it seems the aggressiveness of this Raider team comes and goes. We didn't <laughs> see it. We didn't see well, it. Well, what's the most uh, important thing, though? You always say the word. What's the C word? Consistency. There's Thank no you. consistency. And I think... The Raiders have lost the brand of football that helped them win games last year. So last year, the, the identity of this team yeah. came right away once Antonio Pierce took over. They were a physical football team. They weren't going to beat themselves with a lot of penalties. And they were going to be aggressive, right? They're going to push the envelope. This year, I, I don't see now why they're still not heavily penalized. They had more penalties uh, on Sunday than they have had in the first two games. But they're still relatively disciplined when it comes to penalties. I'm not seeing the aggressiveness. I'm not seeing the physicality that we saw last year in the second half of the season when Pierce took over. They were out physical by the Chargers in week one, and their run defense is atrocious. They are 28th in rushing yards allowed per game. 28th. They allowed 176 <laughs> in week one, I believe 151 or 155 in week two, and then they allowed 133. Chuba Hubbard had one of his best career games against the Raiders' run defense. And by the way, this is a team that signed Christian Wilkins in free agency. And I did say on the show, like, while Christian Wilkins, pretty good at rushing the passer, his run defense is so-so. So, -so. so right. they ha they're going to have to solve something in the middle of that defense. They're going to have to solve something along the offensive line because they've had multiple offensive line combinations already. They they're easing Jackson Powers Johnson, as I expected, into the, into the lineup. We'll see how much he plays against the Browns. But they, they're not winning in the trenches like they were last year, and that has to change. Right. And you mentioned Jackson Powers Johnson. I, I don't want to get out too much on a side tangent. I want to get back to your main point. But he played right guard as well. Like, And, and Antonio Pierce said that that was planned. I'm like, I don't understand. You got this rookie who's coming in. He played center in college. He played guard way back when he first started. But, but he was a center. So you're already switching him to left guard. And then you're going to put him in at right guard? Like, I don't – I mean, in an emergency, I get that. But this is a guy who's going out for his first action. Again, coaching decisions that make no sense. And where's Marvin Lewis? Where's all these guys? Oh, Marvin Lewis. Oh, he's got all these great guys around. I, did, I have not seen any great decision-making so far from this Raiders team. And putting Jackson Powers Johnson in his first real action in two different positions in the same game make zero sense. If somebody can explain it to me, if I'm the idiot, let me know. It can be possible. But I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't, I just don't get it. Right. So, so that's what it gets back to. But to your point about the run defense, atrocious, everybody's oh, this defense, the offense doesn't have to be good. The defense will carry us. Well, that's if you're consistent. Okay. So you look at the defense and, and, and the Raiders defense, forget just the run overall. If you look at their three games, okay, you're talking four quarters a game. That's 12 quarters. They've played complete defense, maybe nine or 10 of those. Okay. Then you look at the offense. The offense has played really one quarter out of four games, and they've been effective in one quarter, and that was the fourth quarter against Baltimore. 
So, boy, I mean, again, I'm not here to make Raider fans feel worse. I'm not here to say there's no hope to turn things around a little bit. But, boy, there's got to be something to figure out. And I see a lot of people already going and blaming the coach, and he deserves some of the responsibility. But my bigger concern is with what he said at the press conference is the fact that what's going on in this locker room? I thought this locker room was all joy. You know, it was all fun, and everybody loved everybody, and everybody loved the coach and all this stuff. It seems like people aren't on the same page. Scott, what did I say at the beginning of the show? The honeymoon is over. <laughs> and once once you start losing football games, oh yeah, all of that, all of that goodwill and good feelings from the previous year go out the window. I think Antonio Pierce said it on Monday that last year was last year. He said, "We're the, we, you know, we have one of the worst. We have the worst rushing offense in the league right now, and the Raiders are averaging two point eight yards per carry as a team rushing, running the football. Two two point. Remember, the average is around three point eight to four yards a carry. They're a whole yard below." Below the average. Yes. And they play one of the worst run defenses in the league on Sunday. It's inexcusable, Scott. Yes. that That's what I was going to say is not only did they play one of the worst defensive fronts in the league, they got, they got completely owned. I mean, their initials are tattooed on the ass of the offensive line of the Raiders. I mean, that's how bad it was. I mean, they did whatever they wanted. Then you got to look at the situation with Luke Getze. Does he make it through the year, Mo? I mean, it's that bad. It is that bad. And I want to say Bears fans told me about this. I mentioned this on the show, too. <laughs> me too. That they're, they're, one of their biggest gripes about Luke Getze was too many screens and short passes. Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, maybe he's doing that now because of the way the offensive line's playing so poorly. But when you're down, I don't know, two, three scores – you got to put put in an extra offensive lineman if you have to max protect so you can get the ball downfield. Right, anything to get the ball downfield because you're not gonna erase a lead dinking and dunking your way down the field and you're down multiple scores at home. By the way, you're getting right. crushed. And keep in mind, this was again Dave Canales, who was a less experienced head coach, out coaching Patrick Graham's defense. This was Ejiro Evero, the defensive coordinator of the Panthers, out coaching Luke Getzey. This is just there was there was not much positive to take from this game. And I when I got on the Bleach Report Live, I said the only good thing I can really say about this one is, you know, maybe Alexander Madison has something going where you if yeah. you want to get the short pass a game going instead of the run game, if you're still struggling with that, then throw short passes to Alexander Madison because that seems to work. And by the way, he he again took the goal line carry and scored early in that game. And I've been telling fans that Zamir White is not the goal line back. I know Ooh. Zamir White is this big hulking running back. They're not giving Zamir White the ball at the goal line. They're giving it to Alexander Madison. And that tells you a lot about how they feel about Zamir White and his fit in this game. Well, and, and two things I want to talk about. I mentioned it earlier, and, and, and the story I wrote on Sunday night on Sports Not about this disgrace of a game was the fact, going back to we've seen issues with, with uh, Antonio Pierce making calls on fourth down. And there were, there were three minutes left in the third quarter. They're down by 21 points. And they punt the ball uh, on on they were on their own thirty eight yard line. I understand that, but you're down by three touchdowns. Mo, where is ur the urgency? That's what I don't understand. When you're a head coach in the NFL, and remember, this is the guy. This is the guy who talks about physicality, pain, violence, aggressive, right? Which I got no problem with. But he gets to that point. You're you're getting your ass kicked, and you punt the ball. So that tells me. And I think you said this last last Sunday on X. You said he doesn't have any confidence in his offense. Clearly. Then find somebody who can get you your offense in the right direction and that you have confidence in. Because clearly he doesn't have confidence in Getze or his players on the offense, the offensive line. Yes, it needs work, clearly. But to me, the continued look, you have, you're going to make errors. We all knew that. We've talked about it numerous times here on the show, Mo. And that's fine. But these kind of errors are different. This is not, hey, you make a call, a call doesn't work out. This is showing a lack, I think, of understanding and knowing what it is when you're in the NFL and you're down by three scores. You got to get something going. You have to move the ball, and they don't seem to do that. And you go back to what you're talking about, the dinking, dunking. Yes, it takes pressure off the quarterback as the offensive line. But even when they did have good protection, I said it the other day. How many times is Gardner Minshew under center? Never until he's going to he's going to do a quarterback sneak. And guess what? The defense knows that too, right? 
So they can't get anything going. How are you going to run the ball when you're in, in shotgun all the time? You start four yards back. No wonder they don't have any rushing yards. I think a caller brought that up. <laughs> I think our guy in South Florida. Yes, South, South Florida, Florida Raider. Raider. Yep. Brought that up. Uh, shout out to him. But it, I think it was pointed out during the broadcast, too, that the Panthers had an early jump. Their defense had an early jump on whatever the Raiders are doing offensively. So now not only do you have a predictable offense, but you have a one-dimensional offense that can't run the football. And what did I say last week, Scott? I said, regardless of what, I want to see the Raiders run the football well against the Panthers. Right. Because if they don't figure out the run game and they become one-dimensional, they're going to be a lot easier to defend no matter who's on the other side. Brock Bowers, Devontae Adams, we'll get into those guys who didn't get enough targets, in my opinion. Brock Bowers <laughs> had maybe one or two targets by the fourth quarter. Right. I know he got hurt, but one or two targets by the fourth quarter is – baffling to me but anyway you have one dimensional offense and a predictable offense that's a recipe for scoring fewer than 20 points a game which is what we're going to see out of the Raiders if they don't start running the football well or getting the short passing game going absolutely and and I think that the, there was there's a situation where somebody asked me that question on the post game show in the chat and it was like wait a minute so Luke Getze saw what happened in the fourth quarter in Baltimore when he actually said oh I'm going to run plays to my best playmakers. And guess what it did, Mo? It worked against a much better team, by the way. So what does he do? He comes back. It's like he never, he, like the Baltimore game never happened. They don't target the right guys. They don't do, you don't see any imagination on offense. Again, it's all so vanilla. And I, okay, great. If, if that's the case that your offensive line is not doing well, Tom Telesco, you have a lot to answer for. Because you went into the season with these bodies. Oh, Theo Munford. Oh, you know. All these guys, you wanted them, right? You got cap space. You could have maybe done something. They haven't done anything. So you look at that, and and you have to say to yourself, okay, a lot of multiple issues here. You can't blame one person or one situation. The quarterback, Minshew, yes, didn't play well. Coaching wasn't good. All that stuff. So it's a big conglomeration, just a big ball of mess right now. And now we will see what the coach is made of. We will see what this team is made of. Because this is some serious, serious adversity after this game, right? To be embarrassed that badly at home in every facet of the game, um, that shines a light on the organization. So we'll see what happens when they come out against Cleveland next week. I expect to see some lineup changes because the way Antonio Pierce said, we're going to make business decisions after he pointed out some individuals. He said mm -hmm. individuals. He didn't say players, but we're kind of guessing he's talking about certain players because he said as the game went on, certain individuals made business decisions. He didn't want to say the team as a whole didn't, didn't come with the fire that they had to. He said certain individuals. So I expect to see whether it's the offensive line, the secondary defensive line. I expect to see some moves made where certain guys may see fewer snaps on the field than mm -hmm. we're used to seeing. Certain guys will get more snaps because they're backups and maybe will show a little bit more, but Something has to change. I know it's early. Like you said, it's only we're only three weeks into the season. It's still September. But if you don't nip this in the bud now, this whole thing could snowball and your season can run off the rails before Halloween happens. So and <laughs> you don't want that to happen because if that no. happens, then you're talking about a fire sale by the trade deadline. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, I know that on the Pat McAfee show on Monday, they broke down the film and they showed some film of Jack Jones baby taking care of his own business now that's their play on it go watch it you can see it i'll link it down in the description on the video and the in the podcast but and that's that's ap's guy right he's his guy so if he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing and taking care of his own business as a team business whew, you're right they got to nip that in the butt all right we're going to take a break and we come back we're going to do the rest of the show with calls because we got so many calls, and we still can't get to them all on this one show, so we will get to the rest of them, I promise you. But obviously, the phone started ringing before the final whistle even <laughs> happened on Sunday with the uh, Silver and Black Today uh, mailbag phone voicemail. So we're going to get to that as well. All right? So don't go anywhere. This is Silver and Black Today and Odyssey Sports Original Podcast. By the way, thanks and shout out to our friends at BetUS, who you'll hear about right now. All right, friends, Raider Nation, you know how much we love BetUS here, a great supporter of Silver and Black today. And I just want to tell you about what you can do. We got a great offer from them. You get 150% 
Bonus on your first deposit up to $2,000 by using our special code YouTube150. That's YouTube150. Your first deposit up to $2,000 and you are getting 150% on that. And by the way, not only that, they are so good to us and so good to you in Raider Nation that if you also do a second or third deposit, they're going to give you 125% bonus up to $2,000 as well. Just use the code YouTube 150 again to get this special offer. And again, if you haven't gone up to BetUS, you know, every week on Thursday's show, we go into our bets here. But if you haven't been to BetUS and you're looking for a place to bet football, to bet whatever you want, even politics, they got it for you. But go here, you can get a personal account manager, fastest payouts, instantly get your winnings. Uh, and not only that, but you go through here and I'll tell you what, when I go through and I bet football and bet US, I love it because I can always find what I want to do. I go into week four here as I'm starting to look ahead and I know the Raiders are favored against the uh, the Browns, right? So what are we going to do there? I, I, again, after what happened last week, we're talking about in this show how disgusting it was. I just think the Raiders bounce back. Again, maybe I'm being the optimist. I know a lot of you out there are pessimistic with good reason. But I look at this game and I see the Raiders as a one-point favorite at home against the Browns. Browns struggle. Listen, Deshaun Watson's not the same player he was. So what I like is I look at this game and I say, okay, after all that happened last week, I I find they're going to have a bounce back. Now, how's the rest of the season going to go? I don't know. But I look at this one-point spread and I like this. So what I'm doing is I'm putting $50 on the Raiders. Now, some of you guys out there are going to call me crazy (laughs) after last week when they couldn't move the ball. Something just tells me that you're going to see the Raiders perform well against this Browns team. Now, the Browns defense is good. We don't know how Miles Garrett is. He's got the foot injury. We'll see if he comes back. But I like the Raiders in this game to bounce back, to give Raider Nation what they deserve, which is a good show at home. So I do that. So here you can see how easy this is. You can find the games. The the props are not up yet. It's early in the week, but you can get to that as well. I'll show you that. But I'm putting $50 down here. You can see this. I am confirming my bet. So there you go. I am picking the Raiders to cover against the Browns. Now, I don't know if they win by three points or two points, but I know they're going to win by more than one. So we like it that way. But I love this too, because you can go into here and I'm going to go into the Raider game again, scroll down just for a second here. And I go into markets. I can see all sorts of things in here. Not only can you bet the point spread as I just did, you can bet the over under as usual, but you can also find other things later in the week. Like you can bet on the halves, you can bet on the quarters. And then of course the game props, which come up here, which there's early ones now, you know, who scores the first, what's the first first scoring play of the game? Is it a Browns TD, a Browns field goal? Is it a Browns other score? Is it a Raiders field goal? Is it a Raiders TD? You can see that all here. Great stuff here. So my advice to you is to go support our good friends over at BetUS because they support us here and they make this video possible. That's right. They bring you the post game shows. They bring you all the video here. So we appreciate it. Make sure that you go to BetUS, again, 150% first deposit up to $2,000 using the code YouTube150. Again, YouTube150 up on BetUS. Go check them out and let us know how you do this weekend. Enough of hearing us talk about the Raiders. It's time to hear from From you. Many Oakland Raider fan, Las Vegas Raider fan. Stand up. On this edition of the Raider Nation Mailbag. Got a black hole rocking and rolling. Don't be a wallflower. Be a part of the show. Leave your question or message by calling 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Or drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. All right. We are back. We're going to get to your calls. Silver and Black Today. An Odyssey Sports originally podcast, by the way. Video brought to you by... Our good friends at BetUS, who you just saw a little betting action there I showed you. So make sure you check out our good friends at BetUS. Okay, Mo, we got a lot to talk about. By the way, you see I'm in my Studio B. Studio A is the other one. I'm in Studio B now. I've expanded my studios. I'm just kidding. Moving around, getting some stuff done in the house. So we had to do that. All right. And Mo's wearing a tie. Did you notice this? We're both, you know... We're upgrading, you know. You got your nice, fancy, schmancy studio. I'm in a shirt and tie today, schmancy. so we're we're all we're all business. As they turn to say, we're oh. all making business decisions. So we're all business today. We we are we are, and we can tackle better, I think. So, <laughs> I mean, that's another thing I gotta say. I've never the tackling in the NFL overall has suffered, 
But man, the Raiders had so much. And even I, I love to see that Tommy Eichenberg was out there, by the way, Mo, but he had some whiffs. Yeah. Some terrible I, I, but, I, but I expect I do, that from a rookie. I, yeah, I expect it's his first full game out there. Yeah. I expect that from Tommy yeah. Eichenberg. I, I, I didn't take anything from that. But some of the veterans in their tackling. Different story. Different Brutal. Story. Brutal. Okay. We're going to get off to your calls now. We're going to start out. We're going to go out to Utah. And we're going to start in Salt Lake City with our good friend Armando. Armando, give it to us, brother. Scott and Mo, this is Armando from Salt Lake City by way of New Jersey. I'm calling after the Panther game. Um, <laughs> truth be told, I could have been calling uh, after the first offensive series in the second half where it was run, run, pass. Because that's when I knew that the game was over. <sighs> What can I say? A I mean, when you've been watching Raider football as I have for the last three decades, Oof. this wasn't surprising. We all knew this was going to happen. And Mo asked the question on the X or Twitter or whatever it's called now, why there needs to be a case study on why this happens. Mm. For me, it comes to a lack of preparation and an inability to, to an, an inability to have attention to detail. What I mean by that is you look at last week and what worked towards the end of the game. And this game, I understand that the Panther run defense, uh, not up to snuff. Um, and you want to be able to establish what's working. Um, well, not what's working, but what you want to uh, assert yourself as. Um, and going away from what was working for you, um, that's where the game was lost. It was once I saw in the second half that we did not um, pass to set up the run like we established last week on the show when we, when we talked about that, um, the game was lost. Um, and it was a stubbornness on offense. And then on defense, it was not adjusting to their adjustment. Once again, like Mo said last week, you need to be able to adjust to their adjustment. Their biggest adjustment was bringing in Andy Dalton in place of Bryce Young. Why the hell are we dropping back in zone and letting a veteran quarterback pick us apart? Because that's what a veteran quarterback is going to do. That might work against, with, against Bryce Young. It's not going to work against Andy Dalton. Lack of preparation. I don't know what to say. I mean, this is the same song and dance, and something needs to change. <laughs> For me, it's the culture of the team. Um, it's we're we're taking a, a, a lap, or the, the bus lap after the KC game in 2020. We're smoking cigars after a regular season win this year. I get it. I get that the cigar thing was important to us last year. Um, with the previous regime and how that was being run, that we needed to change the identity and start to establish some fun. But let's leave that in 2023. This is 2024. There you go. Armando, great call. Great call. So much said within that call. I can't disagree with any of it. Yeah, I mean, to his point, culture. I thought that's what this – This I thought the Antonio Pierce hire was the culture hire, and the culture was – back to Raider swagger, right? All the off season videos and all that kind of stuff. And it, and you and I said this during the summer, Mo, not that we had doubts per se, but you got to do it on the field. Remember, remember I go back Antonio Pierce resume on the grass. Well, your resume looks like crap right now. Armando brought up a good point about why this keeps happening. And it mm. just seems as if no matter what coaches staff, the Raiders have, what, you know, who they have on the field, the Raiders don't pay good attention to deets, the finer details. Mm. I don't mean just like just throwing on a film and knowing who's starting and who's going to line up where. I mean, like the finer details. What worked last week? How can we counter what they're doing? How can we make adjustments? Because I also said last week that the Raiders are going to have to prepare for teams to defend them the way they play that last Ravens game. And what I mean by that is, Throwing to set up the run, so you know that Brock Bowers and Devontae Adams are out there. So you're gonna you're gonna probably drop an extra defender in the coverage. You you know you may change up your coverage is based on what the Raiders did in that final quarter against the Ravens. So now the Raiders have to counter that counter. 
It's a chess match. While it's a physical football game, it's also a chess match between the play callers. And the Raiders thoroughly lost that chess match. It was checkmate by the end of the first quarter. Yeah. No and point. you can see it coming a mile away, just as Armando said. I, I've been watching the Raiders for 30-plus years. And for the last 20-plus years, they have these games where they make you believe that one week that things are going to be different from the previous years of disaster. And then a game like this happens, and it sets you back, and it's like, yep, this is why the narratives are out there about the Raiders being the same old Raiders, because of games like this. You get a backup quarterback, you get a number two running back, you get a head coach who's in his third game as a head coach, and you get plastered at home in front of your fans with a better roster. Right. Doesn't make any sense, but it's been Raider football for the past 20 plus years, unfortunately. Well, not only that, and 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 our good friend Vinny Bonsignor at the Las Vegas Review Journal kind of made this the premise of his story. I think it was on Monday, and I agree with him on this, which is the Raiders have been bitching, the players, bitching about we don't get respect. We don't get respect. Look at, oh, they say we're going to finish last. You get what you deserve, brother. Like, unless you prove it, who the hell are you? Who cares? Right? So, so I know Raider fans get mad about that too. Justifiably. I get it. But dude, respect is not given. It's earned. You got to earn it on the field, brother. And they haven't earned it on the field yet, at least consistently. So there you go, Armando. Thanks for the call. All right, we're moving on to Dominique, our good friend out in St. Louis. Scott Moe, it's Dominique from the Show Me State. How you guys doing? Well, Raiders do it again to us. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, let me just say, the defense is overrated. I don't want to hear anyone say anything about this defense anymore. The defense is overrated. They're not good. There's no way in the world Andy Dalton should have torched us like he did. And I know he's undefeated against us in his career, but we're supposed to have this top defense stop. Also, we don't have a quarterback. We don't have a running back. We don't have an OC. Antonio Pierce does not look like a head coach at all. He looks in over his head. This is why I was screaming for hardball. Uh, Luke Getzey, as we see, he was the problem in Chicago, not Justin Fields. Justin mm. Fields is doing just fine in Pittsburgh mm. with a real offensive coordinator and a real head coach. Meanwhile, Luke Getze is doing the same crap that he done in Chicago. That's why I was never on board with that hiring. Um, we have to temper expectations for this team every year, like you guys do. That's why I love your show. You guys are real, realistic. You're not sitting out there saying, oh, we can win 10, 11 games. You guys are real. And no, but Raider Nation has to be the same way. Stop setting high expectations for this team until proven otherwise. Um, appreciate you guys and all you do. I'll be listening. Thank you, guys. Talk to you soon. Bye -bye. All right. There's Dominique in Missouri, man. We appreciate it. Another great call. I mean. Make such valid I, points, right? I, I have to say, Scott, if I'm ever in the show me state, I got to sit down and talk ball with Dominic. Just seems like a calm, cool yes. dude. Never like over, over emotional, always <laughs> has great points. I literally, when you said Dominique was up for the call, I literally picked up my phone and started taking notes because I knew I was going to have to write some things down. But <laughs> uh, Antonio Pierce, I, they're already the Joe Bugle, um, Joe Bugle comparisons out there, another former Raiders coach who was an interim became a head coach didn't work out there are comparisons to him being made out there we talked about Harbaugh on the show a lot while we said that we mm -hmm. we understand the hiring of Antonio Pierce because we did for that team after they fired Josh Martinez we get it but we both said Harbaugh would have been the better hire overall now we'll see what Harbaugh does with the Chargers Chargers loss against the Steelers in a great game between two undefeated teams we'll see what what he does and we'll see what Antonio Pierce does and we'll compare resumes at the end of it but I will say about Andy Dalton I said this on the Bleacher Report postgame show that the Raiders are negotiating with Tom Brady right now to give him part ownership of the team. They should give that part ownership to Andy Dalton <laughs> because right now he has he's 4-0 against the Raiders, 10 touchdown passes, no interceptions. Andy Dalton partially Moves. owns the Raiders right now. Yes. And, and it's inexcusable that he is the first quarterback this season to throw for 300-plus yards and three touchdowns in a game. He's the first quarterback to do it against this Raider defense. <laughs> so the Raiders are very generous in giving certain guys their spotlight. This loss is up there with the Baker Mayfield loss in Thursday Night Football, yeah. with the Rams, Brown, Baker Mayfield, the days of that game. 
This is up there with giving Jeff Saturday his only win as a head coach in the NFL against the Colts. This is up there with those losses, but those losses were on the road. This one, again, I want to harp on this. Home opener mm. coming off a momentum swing against the Ravens. You lay not just an egg. You lay a whole dozen eggs in <laughs> front of your home fans with this type of performance. And I'm with Dominique saying this defense is not a top 10 defense. If you can't stop the run, again, they're allowing over 150 rushing yards per game. Yeah. If you can't stop the run, teams are going to take note of this. They're going to run the ball down your throat each and every time until you can prove that you can stop it. This Raider defense in the middle, only interior, big trouble, Scott. Big trouble. Absolutely. Scott. And if the team plays like it has, I'm not saying it's going to because it's been inconsistent. You see moments where they play well. But I, I said it yesterday. I, I I don't know. I don't know if they're going to get to five wins if they play like they played. And seriously. I mean, you know, everybody was pissed about the line in Vegas. And Murph said on the postgame show last Sunday, he said, hey, he's like, damn, Vegas guys seem to always be right. Well, we'll see if they are or not. I bet the over as well. But nonetheless, uh, Dominique, as always, man, we appreciate your call. And thanks for the kind words about the show as well. We work hard to do that, so we appreciate it. All right, going to Misha in Orange County, California. What's up, Scott? What's up, Mo? What's up, Murph? This is Misha calling from Orange County, California. Um, post game. I'm sure the lines are blowing up, <laughs> rightfully so. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, pretty bad. Um, but you know, I I'm going to be honest with you. I can't I can't say I'm surprised at all. Um, a buddy of mine told me earlier in the week. He said, "Yeah, you know, you guys are going to get uh, go up two one uh, after this weekend." And I said, uh, "I don't." I don't think so. Not so fast. I mean, <laughs> the reality is it's in the NFL, it's, it's any given Sunday. Anybody can win at any time. I mean, you can look at how the Broncos destroyed the Bucks this week at home. Um, so it, it's no surprise to me really that uh, we came out and we're just really, really flat footed. Um, obviously, I didn't expect it to be this bad, but um the Panthers put in Andy Dalton and, you know, this is a veteran. I mean, this guy's been in the league for a while. He's a winner uh, for the most part. Um, and it's no surprise really that he, he stepped on to the field and truth, you know, just really reinvigorated the offense for the Panthers. And, and we had absolutely no answer for him. So it's uh it's disappointing to say the least. Um, but you know, it's it's the NFL. You can beat the best team, and you can turn around and lay a big egg, like we did this week. That's how it goes. Um, so on to the next one. Thanks, guys. All right, there you go, Misha in Orange County. Appreciate the call. Now we go on to Pastor Mike behind bars. Scott, no, Pastor Mike behind bars. Here in Vegas, <laughs> sulking in my oh, hotel God. room after this, I guess you would call a game. I mean, I just don't get it. Um, offensive line is horrible. I think that's, I think that's a, a big issue. But even the defense, you have 36 points to this team? Like, come on, man. I don't really get it. You know what? AP said, hey, Raider Nation, show up, we'll show out. Well, I showed up. We showed up. But they didn't show out, man. I'm not panicking one and two, but they've got lots of issues that they're going to have to deal with. Offensive line, um, maybe a little more creative play calling. I don't know. Like, you know, I always say this after a game, especially a game like this, on to the next one, I guess. <laughs> right, let's go Raiders and get the Browns. Talk to you guys later. Raiders. There you go. Poor Pastor Mike in his hotel room crying on those hotel pillows, right? I mean, <laughs> spent all that money to go to the game, but I know he had fun anyway, even though the game wasn't fun. R really quick, Scott, and I'll go back to Misha's call. Oh, yeah. About not being surprised. Yeah. But I, I'm not, again, I've watched Raider football for 30 years of my life, right? 30 plus years. I'm not surprised, but I'm still disappointed because of where it happened. You know, if this happens yes. in week eight, I'm like, yeah, the, the Raiders are good for laying an egg here and there. But to do it in front of fans 
in the home opener, guys like Pastor Mike who are attending the game, traveling, and other, any other fans that are traveling. And I said this on Twitter, and I want to say this here, and I want fans to listen closely, right? These Raider fans here all the time, Raider Nation is the best fan base in the league. They're the best fans around, right? And then Tony Pierce gets up at the podium and says, guys, individuals are making business decisions. And I said, this is how you repay. This is how you show gratitude to the best fan base in the league. <laughs> you lay an egg in front, in front of them in a home opener. That You can say all the nice things you want about fans. And I was more angry for fans because now I'm an analyst. So I'm not, I don't consider myself in the, in the fan space anymore. But just as an analyst, understanding a lot of these people spend their hard-earned money to go to these games, a lot of emotions into these games. Uh, a lot of these parents are raising their kids to be Raider fans. And it's a kind of a family thing. It's not just a sports thing. It's right. a family. It's a family thing. And that's how you repay these, the best fans in the league. That's how you pay. That's how you repay them. That's how you show them gratitude. You go out there and you're making business decisions in your first home game. And by the way, the tickets are sky high. The ticket price oh, is sky most high. expensive in the NFL. So this is this is the this is the thank you you give them. And I think that's what as an analyst. I, you know, I can, you know, Raiders win or lose, I still have a job to do. But to know that these fans are putting their emotions and their money into this, and this is what they get back, to me, that's a slap in the face. 100% agree. Great call, Pastor Mike. All right, we close out the show now with our good friend Tarek. This should be good. He was so excited last week. <laughs> he sounded like, literally, Tarek, you sounded like, you know, a kid on Christmas morning who just got like the new, the new uh, video game system or whatever. Uh, but uh, we'll see how he is today. I have a feeling this will be very biting. Here we go. Here's Tarek. Good evening, Scott and Mo. This is Tarek calling you guys from Boston. What the hell was that? <laughs> I'm sick of this crap every week of every season. I mean, it seems like every time we take a step forward and the fan base is just pumped up and we have some, some good vibes going, we take 10 steps backwards. How can anyone explain us going into Baltimore winning it in their home stadium and coming back in our home opener and putting on this type of a performance against what was was the worst team in the NFL. Um, Getsy needs to be fired within 24 hours. <laughs> Enough already. I hope him and AP and Tolesco have some kind of a, a plan because they need to get rid of him. This is ridiculous. Our offense had no rhythm. The running game is still non-existent, and we resorted back to some disgraceful play calling. This is an embarrassment on, on every level. It's completely inexcusable. And I literally I – was, I was prepared to say I would be ticked off if the game was close in the fourth quarter because I thought we were going to destroy the Panthers. <laughs> we did what we do uh, – what we've done previously. We make subpar quarterbacks look like Peyton Manning. The Red Rifle shredded us all day long. We couldn't stop the run. I'm always going to be a big Raider fan. I'm always going to support him. I'm always going to cheer him on. But the hope is not there anymore. You just There's such inconsistency with this franchise. Let's start with firing Getsy, and then we can hopefully it's still early to salvage the season. The Chargers lost. I don't know how the Donkeys won in Tampa Bay, and I predict Kansas City is going to win tonight in Atlanta. Hope I'm wrong. I'd love to hear your You're thoughts right. on this game. Um, just this team just messes with fans' emotions. The fan base deserves so much more. And golly, this is just ridiculous. Talk to you guys again soon. I hope you have a wonderful week. And hopefully we can get this bad taste out of our mouth. Uh, bring on the Browns a week from today. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. There you go. There's Tarek. Mm -hmm. Can't disagree with that. And his point, though, about and, – and obviously a lot of people upset with Luke Getze because of the, the play calling and this, this offense just being – horrible i mean worse than some of the high school offenses i see um when you when you look at that like he says fire luke getty and i asked you earlier does he make it through the season the problem is how, you're not going to get somebody better per se now you might get somebody better who gets an opportunity who not, doesn't have a lot of experience but you're not going to go out and get some great offensive coordinator after four five six even eight games mo yeah, that's the problem with firing Luke Getzey. And I, I totally I get it because mm -hmm. it's 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 it is atrocious the way this offense is operating. I get some of it is the offensive line not playing well, but the play but the again, you're down multiple scores and you're still dinking and dunking it downfield. De, again, Brock Bowers, one or two targets by the fourth quarter. Devontae Adams, another quiet game. It's just so many things going on there. But like you said, 
if you're firing Luke Getzey at this point, you have to have a decent replacement. And let me tell Raider fans, you don't want Rich Scangarello, the quarterback's coach, taking over the play calling. I just look up Rich Scangarello's, you know, history, his track resume, his, his track record, his resume. It is not good. He's bounced right. around from college to the pros, one year here, one year there, and he can't hold the job right. anywhere. So right. the, the if the alternative is Rich Scangarello, the quarterback's coach, the offense is not going to look much better, let me tell you. Yeah. So the Raiders are, just, are stuck right now in the pickle. You got Raider fans calling for Bo Hardigree to come back. Bo Hardigree, <laughs> by the way, is with the Titans staff right now. Yes. But I, I don't know what the Raiders do if they even were to fire Luke Getzey because it's like, okay, Ritz Gangrel. There's nobody on the staff. Ritz Gangrel, do you let Marvin Lewis go? He's a defensive like, guy. He's, he's a defensive guy. I don't know. But you, you something has to happen there. Yeah. You know, it, something has to happen there between Antonio Pierce, Marvin. He's got all these senior hey. coaches on staff. Marvin Lewis, he's got Tom Coughlin there. If you have to get rid of the offensive guy and you guys just come together as a team, I know they're defensive guys, but if you have a better plan, if you're going to at least put in the gap-blocking scheme again to help Zemir White, then so be it. But we all know Antonio Pierce has the executive decisions here. He's not the play caller. Mm -hmm. But you got, again, you have Marvin Lewis, you have Tom Coughlin in your ear, you have all these senior head coaches. They have to be able to come together and fix the problem whatever it is overall not just the offense but the way this team is operating yeah multiple fixes needed for sure uh and and but i understand it because like who wants to sit here and say well you're in week three i gotta watch 15 more weeks of this guy run the offense i get it right but this was our big concern coming in you and i yeah. talked about it all summer luke about luke getsy didn't say he couldn't do it we just said man we're just unsure because of what happened in chicago and here we are now he doesn't have a great offensive line, doesn't have a great quarterback. And you mentioned Justin Fields. Now, we'll see if Justin Fields keeps it together the whole season, but he's 3-0 and with the Steelers. So right now, he's winning that argument as far as was it him or was it Getze. It might have been a little bit of both, actually. Just sometimes a change of address can, can do you really good, especially when you have a better coaching staff. I would just say the Steelers have a better defense than the Reds right now. The Steelers are allowing the fewest points and yards per yes. game. And also, they have a better offensive coordinator. They have an actual offensive coordinator with proven track record in Arthur Smith, who, by the way, helped Ryan Tannehill win comeback player of the year in 2019. Yep. So they have an accomplished play caller where the Raiders, as I said all offseason, I said my two concerns with the Raiders, their quarterback and their play caller because Luke Getzey has so much to prove, and Luke Getzey is not proving anything right now right. to Raider fans and to anyone. And I, I don't want to beat the dead horse, but I just want to get this point in before we move on, Mo, which is this is what part of the reason why, again, you said it earlier. Hey, if Antonio Pierce gets the job based on his merit, based on his interview, based on all that kind of stuff, Mark Davis makes a decision with his committee or whatever it was. OK, fine. But they didn't talk to anybody else that was really viable. And one of my biggest concerns, you remember, I brought this up to you back in, I don't know, what was that, uh, February, which was with a coach like Harbaugh. What people forget about is it's not just the head coach. It's who they can recruit to come with them. Now, we'll see if Harbaugh works out with the Chargers. I have no idea, okay? His track record would say that he will be successful, but we don't know. But look at who he brought in. <laughs> brought in defensive coordinator from, from Baltimore. Brought in his guy from Michigan. So he brought in head coaches who had really good experiences or offensive minds that had experience. And so that makes a difference. That's when you're hiring a head coach. People get fixated on the one guy. But what you have to look at is what is their connection and what staff can they bring in? Now, the Raiders, by my count, tell me if I'm wrong out there because I could be, have the largest coaching staff in the NFL, 32 coaches. Why so big and the results so bad? Like, you know, there's a lot of shorter staffs out there, I should say um, uh, smaller staffs that do more. So it's just a weird thing. We'll have to see how it works out but we certainly appreciate everybody calling in and um, we'll get to more calls later in the week too. Don't, don't worry about it. If you called in and didn't get on, I will get you on next time. And if you're going to call in between now and Thursday, we'll get you on as well. Mo, before we check out of here today is Tuesday. Let everybody know what you got coming up Wednesday into Thursday. So Wednesday, I'm going to have a bleach report live. We're going to talk about some decisions that the Raiders should or could make before uh, Sunday's game against the Cleveland Browns. 
Antonio Pierce is already non-committal about Garner Minshew starting against the Browns because they asked him about Garner Minshew being benched at the end of that Carolina Panthers game, Aiden O'Connell coming in. So there could be a quarterback switch. I do know there's going to be some changes in the secondary because Marcus Epps has a torn ACL. He's out for the season. So we're going to see a new starter at safety for sure because of injury. So I'll talk about some of the changes we could see on Wednesday. And of course, I may be having a topic to talk about on Thursday about the Raiders and what they could do uh, with Coy Wire over on TNT Sports, wearing a shirt, cool. high, of course. And, of, and I'll have a sports not piece coming up uh, talking about possible changes that I'd like to see personally, not oh. what the Raiders could do, but just me personally, what I like to see going forward. Well, sure. You save the juicy stuff for TV. <laughs> course i'm kidding uh all good yeah make sure you guys catch mo there as well and he will be back with me here on thursday we'll have another enthralling edition of silver and black today we'll take a look ahead at cleveland i'm saying right now that he does not go to o'connell this game i think he's giving Minshew one more game that's just my my gut feel i could be wrong but that's what I i'm agree. thinking we'll see I now i think he'll have a short leash in that game against cleveland because I think the pressure that Antonio Pierce is going to feel right now from a lot of different places is going to be at the forefront of his mind. So we'll see how it all works out, but it's good. All right, my friend, thank you so much. Take care, Scott. Take care, Raider Nation. <laughs> all right. Uh, for our producer, Mike Robbie from Emote, and I'm Scott Branson. This has been Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you get your audio. If you're watching us on video, thanks so much for that and for being part of the chat. Make sure you subscribe. Hit the notifications bell. And again, thanks to our great friends and partners who bring the video to you. That, of course, is BetUS. Don't forget, YouTube150 is the code. Get 150% deposit bonus on up to $2,000 on your first deposit. And then you get 125% on the second and third deposit up to $2,000. So do that and tell them Mo and Scott sent you. Until Thursday, take care, Raider Nation. It'll get better. Trust me. Have a good one.